Um, my parents were divorced when I was 14 years old. And as a result, I both long for and distrust longevity, let alone permanence in relationships. And I feel like I could throw my papers up in the air and end my talk here because essentially, you now know everything you need to know about me. <laughs> However, um, I have covered this conflict with the fiercest independence and a queer life that has celebrated all the lovers I have amassed over 40 years of falling in love and then breaking up. But let me go back again to 1967 when my parents uh, divorced and I yearned to have my first boyfriend. My parents weren't hippies, I assure you. But the values they married under in 1950 had given way to a new entitlement to self-fulfillment. And the duties of marriage were not compatible with the freedom for personal exploration. My father had an affair with his 26-year-old secretary, duh, and my parents divorced. My mother then struggled financially, and I was no longer able to keep up with the purchase of the necessary fashionable goods that defined being cool. And for this, I was deeply resentful, and I focused all of my resentment on my mother, not my father. He visited regularly, gave us gifts, and took us out to lovely dinners. My association with a divorced woman also stained me socially. Back then, a divorced woman was feared by her friends because she had been sexually awakened through marriage and now was hungry for more. She could steal their husbands. My mother couldn't get a credit card in her name, and because she had stopped work when she got married at my father's insistence, she had a terrible time finding a job. It was a point of pride for my father to be able to support a wife and then his kids. But 17 years later, divorced with three children, she was short on money and had no professional skills. I did not identify with my mother. I hated her. And I vowed to be different, like most adolescent daughters do. I hated her loss, her weakness, and her demeaned social status. Her life, let's face it, was a poor sales pitch for marriage. I went to college in 1971 and dove headfirst into radical feminism. Yes, consciousness raising groups, we started the country's second rape crisis center. In feminism, I found an ethos, principles that matched my history, my fears, and my rugged independence. Feminism fit me. Marriage, please, a repressive institution for women. I was completely smitten with my best friend Cindy Katz, and we decided we would form a quaternary marriage a combined marriage of two heterosexual couples, um, the two of us, of course, and our boyfriends. She was in a long-term relationship, and at this point, I was kind of going through a lot of guys. Um, <laughs> we read about it somewhere, and it seemed perfect. Divide your dependence among three other people and have your best friend in the house with you. <laughs> I came out as a lesbian in my first semester of graduate school. The time between having my first inkling that I might be attracted to women and kissing my then best friend was about 24 hours. It was 1975, what can I say? That relationship only lasted about a month, but I loved my newfound identity as a social outlaw. I loved the secret community I was now a member of. And let me stress something that I haven't said clearly before. I never hated men. I hated my mother's marriage to one. I identified with my father and his apparent freedom. And once my own freedom was firmly established by moving out and forming deep roots in my own radical social world, I forgave my mother completely and we actually became very close. She had also recovered from the divorce by then and I came out to her within two weeks of that first kiss. I transformed the trauma of being different into a celebration, a private party with my peers. I never dreamed of some new gay normalcy. The price of assimilation would be the loss of my outlaw status and the rabble-rousing power that that gave me. And in terms of my politics, marriage was not something this lesbian would ever fight for. I was after civil rights. I marched in the Gay Pride March every year, minus about three, since 1976. And I have viewed the marriage equality movement as a drain on our community's resources, a conservative push to marriage straight people, to mimic straight people, exactly the thing I wanted to get away from. Remember my mother? And then in 1992, I had a child using anonymous sperm donor number 64, <coughs> relabeling me a single lesbian parent. I was pregnant that, at the same time that Murphy Brown, the television character, was. And the, pres the vice president at the time, Dan Quayle, condemned her and by association me for, uh, let me get the quote right, mocking the importance of fathers by bearing a child alone. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> 
let's detour back to my professional life. Around this time, I became trained as a divorce mediator, although I rarely used these skills to help heterosexual, legally married couples divorce. Instead, I helped couples whose relationships took place outside the law separate <coughs> outside the law. Together, we create individualized and highly personal terms for the equitable distribution of their goods, money, pets, children, etc. My ultimate conclusion, my clinical opinion, breaking up sucks any way you slice it. And then four years ago, admittedly a bit scarred and jaded from all the love lost and found along the way, I met Scout, a transgender man, and more than that, a, a person who spans centuries, a transgenerational person. He's really only a visitor to this century. <laughs> to know him is to know it's that. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> we met at an LGBT health conference in DC, and I dismissed him immediately as a player, despite finding him brilliant and charming. Besides, he was way too young for me. But he wooed me in an old-fashioned way after the conference with letters. Yes, the letters were typed on a computer, and yes, they arrived in my email account, but they were letters. And like Cyrano de Bergerac, I fell in love with the articulate and diffident 19th century man who wrote me those letters. A few other facts about the odd pairing of Scout and me. He lives in a small town in Rhode Island, and is the father of three children who live with him two weeks out of every four. I am a dyed-in-the-wool New Yorker and still a single parent of an extremely complicated, now 20-year-old. My son has a crisis of some magnitude at least once per month. <laughs> Scout and I don't live together, and it <coughs> isn't even possible to consider it until his youngest child goes to college, should he be so lucky, in another five years. The truth is, I kind of like it this way. I guess I confessed to him some night in the dark that I longed for forever, that I wished a thing like marriage could work, that a promise could keep the love and deep intimacy we had going forever. I wanted to never have to delete the photos like you know you have to do when you break up. I wanted to be, always be able to turn to him and say, what was the name of that place in Puerto Rico? I wanted to believe in forever, and I envied those who did, but I still didn't. Scout held on to my secret, uh, my secret wish for forever, and believe me, I told him it was a secret. Despite how much I ranted to the contrary by daylight, and despite how often I broke up with him for some perceived crime or other. Publicly, I still say and believe that, marriage is, that while marriage has changed legally from the one my mother entered and left, it is still a repressive institution. I do not want to ask a fucking judge for permission to leave a relationship. That should be my decision. And then this past June, uh, Scout and I were invited to the White House for their annual LGBT Pride event. It was amazing to be there, actually more than I would have predicted. We traveled down separately, of course, and Scout missed his plane. Um, but I was thrilled to be there, even alone. <laughs> I met Melissa there. And yes, finally, Scout showed up, and we celebrated with other activists and friends who were there in attendance. And at some point late in the event, Scout called my name. I turned around to look at him, and he fell down on one knee. Perhaps you've seen the video. I put my hand spontaneously over my mouth and backed away. <laughs> I didn't hear a word he said as the Marine Band was playing loudly, but I know the universal sign for dropping down to one knee. My first thought after, <clears throat> oh shit, was, was to look around and see, is anybody else watching? <laughs> yes, about 100 people stopped to stare. What was I gonna do? I don't want to be married. I want to be an outlaw. I don't want the legal system in my bedroom or even my kitchen. Is anybody still watching? Yes, the crowd of people is going, look at him down on his knee like an old-fashioned gentleman. I love him. It would be great if I could love him forever or what's left of my forever. But what if he's an asshole to me? And then I'll have to stay with him. Time was passing and I felt how humiliating this must be for that crazy time traveler still on his knee. I took a deep breath and I made the first promise to myself, take the plunge, Liz, and just give it your best. And then I made the promise to him. I said a loud yes and I fell down on my knee to meet him. I understood that this was simultaneously a very private and a very public event. I had no idea it would set off such a political firestorm on the right and such a romantic firestorm in our community. I thought erroneously this was just between me and Scout. So the love and especially the hatred we received was really shocking to me. 
Now I'm engaged and everybody knows it. I was ambushed. I couldn't say no. Some people who watched the video were struck by this, as were some of my friends, and they were angry at Scout on my behalf. It took me weeks, oh, let's face it, months, to realize that Scout did ambush me, <coughs> but not to control me. Not because he is unconflicted about marriage, but because he was willing to play the fool, to give me what he understood I wanted and I was afraid to acknowledge. My dream, that everlasting love, had come true for me. I've tried to tell myself that if we successfully made this unusual kind of relationship, we could make our own kind of marriage. But after much thought, I actually want to say I don't think that's true. If I say a simple sentence to you, a stranger, like, my husband thinks he left his glasses here, or I check, I have an intake form and I check married, I cannot stop you from having the following assumptions. He is a cisgender man meaning he was assigned male at birth. I am heterosexual, gag. We live together. <laughs> we share our finances, or at least a joint checking account. We are monogamous. We are step-parents to each other's children. We're on the same health insurance plan. We spent Thanksgiving together. Actually, only one of those is true. We are currently monogamous. So what, you say? Who cares what they think? I care. Be the change you want to see in the world. I want to see all relationships be honored. I don't want the false new respect this one now gets. Like over my friendship with Jackie, for example, one of my best friends for over 30 years. No sex, no romance, but she is more my daily domestic partner. I, I'm the one who helps her clean out her closet. I help her pack for every trip. She has not bought a new pair of eyeglass frames without my approval, and we only go to Costco together. <laughs> Working for NYU, she also has health insurance that would be more valuable to share than Scouts, which only recognizes providers in New England. But no honor is given to my relationship with Jackie. Many progressive leaders claim that abiding love cannot be a sin. My love for Scout is powerful, but I don't know that it'll be abiding. I can only hope so. But similarly, all my previous loves, while finite in length, were not sins either. Time cannot be the measure of goodness. And yes, despite all I've said here, or given all I've said here, I took the next step myself. Together with Scout on an Amtrak train to Washington, D.C. about six weeks ago, I suggested to Scout that we elope. And yesterday morning, in the study of Rabbi Sharon Kleinbaum of the LGBT synagogue here in New York City, we got married. This time, it was both personal and consciously political, but very private. I did not want a wedding where I asked all of my ambivalent friends, come celebrate my relationship. <laughs> that seemed crazy and disrespectful. We told our children in advance about the plan, but we chose our, our <coughs> witnesses to represent the complicated promise that marriage can be, that we should all work to make it be. We tipped our hats to the past in many ways, in terms of the Jewish tradition and our outfits, and, and to the future. Melissa was there as one of our witnesses, and our friend James Clementi, the brother of Tyler Clementi, who, the gay Rutgers student who took his life a little over a year ago. Uh, we also had two other trans youth there as our witnesses. People, we hoped, who could use our story to bolster their own romantic fantasies for their futures. We want them to want to have a future. Let the record show, I'm as tortured about all of this today as I was last week. Only now, I'm married. <laughs> Me, married to Scout. I am terrified, thrilled, and embarrassed. <laughs> And I think that's the exact right combination. Mm -hmm. I will never call him my husband. But let the record also show I am madly in love with Scout, and I do hope to stay with him forever. Thanks. <laughs>